there was a light dusting of snow beginning to fall. As we pulled up to the school and my mom unlocked the automatic doors to let me out of the minivan. Her work shift started an hour or two earlier than most other kids' parents, making this early drop-off a daily routine for us. As I walked towards the school doors, I saw the snow begin to fall a little bit heavier. The snowflakes, now coin-sized blobs. But it still wasn't anything abnormal. Just the usual flurries, which we were accustomed to around these parts of southern Ontario. My mom drove off before I realized the front entrance of the school was still locked. It was past 7am, so it should have been open. I figured the custodian was running late and looked around for other options. I managed to find an open window and let myself in, then went to the front door of the school and unlocked it myself from the inside. There were a few of us latchkey kids who got dropped off an hour or two early and got picked up an hour or two late every day. Most of us went home to do-it-yourself microwave dinners and oven-ready frozen fish sticks as our parents left for evening shifts at second jobs. Our diets consisted of pizza pockets and pop-tarts, hungry man and hamburger helper. We knew each other well. The first one to arrive was Preston, a rich kid with blonde hair who thought he could order everybody around just because his father owned a car dealership. He had fancy shoes and name brand clothes and made fun of everyone who didn't. Unfortunately, he was also obnoxious and most kids hated him, so he never got in with the cool crowd despite his efforts to bribe them with invitations to lavish birthday parties and trips to his family lake house. Nobody wanted to spend so much as an afternoon with the kid, let alone a weekend. He pushed open the front doors and marched in like he owned the place, looking around with a scowl. Where the hell is everybody? This place is dead. I realized he was right. The school was more empty than usual, even at this abysmal hour of the morning. Don't ask me. I had to come in through the damn window. It's too cold to stand out there waiting for Gus. Lazy dick is probably huffing glue in the janitor's closet. We should go crash this party. I'm waiting for Justin, I said, trying to think of an excuse. Justin was another latchkey kid who I was semi-friends with. I'd been to his house a half dozen times, but he was a loner. He would just sit in his room and play video games all day if his parents and the rest of the world would let him. Preston sucked his teeth, looking annoyed. Why do you always hang out with that loser anyways? I ignored this as Justin came in at that exact moment, shaking snow out of his black mop of hair. It was really coming down outside now, and it looked like a blizzard was fast approaching. Hey, what's up, man? I said, giving Justin a fist bump. He was looking down at his Game Boy and only half paying attention, but he managed to complete the fist bump, blowing it up afterwards, then went back to his game again. Yo, was all he said back. What are you playing today? Castlevania. Sweet. All right, let's go wake up the stupid janitor now, Preston whined in his most irritating voice. Justin ignored him and looked down at his game, continuing to play. But I did see the faintest scowl of annoyance cross his face. The two of them really didn't like each other. Hang on, Susan will be here any second. Let's just wait for her. The four of us were always wandering the school hallways before class, usually even before the teachers arrived. We just kill time in the computer lab or in the library, But Preston always wanted to try to tell us what to do, like we were his employees or something. Sure enough, Susan came in next, brushing snow off the shoulders of her leather jacket. She stomped her big, black Doc Martin boots, knocking the slush off of them. Then she hiked her backpack up over her shoulder and came in to greet us. This place is dead today, she said, unzipping her coat. Where is everybody? Preston looked like he was ready to explode. That's what I said! Can we please go and see if we can find Gus? Maybe that guy knows what's going on. The rest of us finally relented and we left the front entrance, as the snow steadily began to pile up higher and higher just outside the doors. A handful of younger students in first and second grade came in as we were walking away, and I saw more were arriving behind them. A lot of parents were dropping their kids off early today, trying to get into their jobs before the snow began to fall in earnest. We searched all throughout the school but found no trace of Gus. Even in the basement, his usual hiding place, the old janitor was absent. Well, maybe he's sick or something, Susan said as we went back up the stairs towards the main level of the school. Yeah, I guess, but... What? When's the last time Gus was sick? Can you remember him ever calling in? The guy's like an elderly Iron Man. Once we got back to the main level, I saw it was noticeably darker than usual. What's going on? Is the power out? Preston asked. 
Dude, this school, if it's not one thing, it's another. The power did seem to be out, although there was emergency lighting, which cast a dull glow in the hallway. Murmuring voices could be heard from up ahead, near the main entrance, and we rushed to see what the commotion was all about. We arrived to see the doors of the school had been covered with a wall of snow, which was still pouring down from the sky. The younger kids were huddled around one boy who had a portable radio, and they were listening to the local news broadcast. Finally, North Haven Elementary School is closed due to heavy snowfall. That's right, kids. It's a snow day today. The group of students let out a collective groan, and Justin ran over to the doors, trying to force them open desperately. But they wouldn't budge. We were trapped. At school. On a snow day. A fate worse than death. Things moved quickly after that. It didn't take long for factions to begin forming. Maybe because we'd been assigned Lord of the Flies recently as a reading assignment. Justin, Susan, and I gathered what forces we could from the first and second graders and tried to formulate a plan for extrication. We wanted out. But Preston had other plans. After a quick, failed attempt at recruitment, he resorted to threatening the first and second graders into compliance. Young and foolish, many of them followed him. Believing his promises of unlimited mini-pizza and bread pudding for any who would help him storm the kitchen. Our parents will come for us soon, Susan pleaded with him. Don't do this, you're going to get us all detention. But Preston didn't listen, marching off with a formation of small children behind him, chanting a war cry of breakfast will be ours. After several hours of attempting to force the door open against the ever-building pile of snow, morale was getting low. Worse yet, Justin's Game Boy battery was at critical levels, and he was beginning to speak about changing sides. His loud voice was carrying across the foyer, and several first graders perked up their ears at word of potential cereal and milk. Many of us had not eaten breakfast, and the growling of empty bellies could be heard from all around. There's no way he even got in there, Susan said. That door is reinforced steel with a deadbolt. Preston's probably still trying to get open with a coat hanger. Oh, really? Preston said, coming around the corner with a cold hot dog in his hand. Well, here I was coming to share with you all. I guess you don't want any food. As always, the kid thought he owned the place and everything in it. But in this case, he was dead wrong about that. A fact which Susan quickly pointed out. It's not your food, it belongs to the school. Which means it's ours too. Justin lunged at him then, looking ravenously hungry but several first graders with ketchup smeared under their eyes like war paint appeared out of nowhere and grabbed him. Preston began to eat the half-frozen hot dog, shoving the whole thing in his mouth and licking his fingers afterwards. Mmm, that was good. Too bad there's none left for you guys. He walked away, laughing maniacally. And that was how it started. The Snow Day War. Justin, Susan, and I created a triumvirate of power, ruling over the first and second graders with a spirit of sharing and forgiveness. We each split the provisions we'd been granted that morning by our parents, opening our lunch bags to reveal whatever hideous concoctions they had given us. It wasn't pretty, but we managed to get through lunch without a microwave, surviving on rations of Lunchables, granola bars, and mealy apples. I also had a two-day-old salami sandwich, but nobody was touching that thing, no matter how much I tried to sell them on it. Meanwhile, the snow continued to block out the sun, covering the windows with white shadows growing ever blacker. The emergency power eventually died, as day turned to night and we were left in total darkness. Things got bad in the total pitch blackness that followed. If you thought a self-imposed government created by elementary school children was a warped reality, just imagine the anarchy that would ensue in an atmosphere of total darkness. The first graders lost their minds initially, and a few became mad with the power of invisibility, pinching their classmates and sneaking up on them mercilessly until a couple of kids sounded like they were on the verge of a nervous breakdown. A light appeared suddenly out of the darkness, and I realized it was a flashlight. The dark shape behind it was tall, and I realized it was a man coming down the hallway toward us. Eventually, his familiar face came into focus. Gus? Hey, kids, sorry it took me so long to get in here. I managed to climb in through a hatch in the roof. Now come on, I'm getting you all out of here. We were all relieved beyond words. I ran over to Gus and hugged him tightly, crying as he patted my back. The first and second graders came and joined me, and we all held him in an embrace. And then I heard a sound, 
like a huge metal stake being driven through a piece of meat. I felt something warm and wet dripping down onto my head from above, and heard a raspy gurgling sound. Gus's flashlight fell to the floor with a loud clatter, and in the glow of it I saw him collapse to the floor, a spear fashioned from a sharpened yardstick protruding from his throat. His hands were reaching up to grab it, to pull it out, but his lips were turning blue, his breathing becoming more desperate. And without warning, he was completely still, and I realized the old janitor was dead. The group of us looked up to see Preston standing there with a twisted smile on his face. He had several more spears clutched in one hand, and he pulled one out from the rest, holding it up like a javelin he was preparing to throw. Nobody leaves Prestonton. I am your emperor. I tell you what to do and where to go. And I say, none of you are going anywhere. Preston had clearly gone mad with power at some point, maybe even before we got snowed in. I noticed none of the kids were with him anymore and hoped they were okay. We're getting out of here, Preston. With or without you. He lifted another yardstick and threw it without warning. The sharpened point of it flew straight at my head as he screamed an incomprehensible war cry. That was when Justin did the unthinkable. He dove in front of me. His Game Boy clutched in his hand. No! His voice called out in slow motion. The small gray block of electronics took the brunt of the damage from the spear, blocking its path like a Kevlar vest stopping a bullet. The wooden projectile was sticking out of the screen as Justin fell to the floor, clutching his bleeding hand. Hey, thanks man, I owe you one. Come on, I said, helping him up. Let's get the hell out of here before he throws another one. The three of us called the other kids after us and we ran towards the gym, where it looked like Gus had come from. Wooden spears came flying over our heads, landing on the floor of a hallway. We stomped them beneath our feet as we ran past, and I looked over my shoulder to see Preston preparing to throw another. We docked into the double doors of the gymnasium, just as a spear came whizzing past my face. My heart was pounding with fear as I realized that it would have killed me if I'd stayed where I was a second longer. We ran up onto the stage where a cold breeze could be felt coming in through the ceiling. The first and second graders were already climbing up the scaffolding leading to the catwalk, where the hatch could be accessed by a ladder. As I reached the upper level of the catwalk, I heard the gym doors crash open with a bang. It was Preston, and he was walking towards the scaffolding with murder in his eyes. That's when I remember the signs down below us, which Gus had installed. Do not shake the scaffolding, they read. The structure was notoriously wobbly, and only adults were allowed to go up to the top, in order to change lights for plays and school productions. Get down here, or I'll make you come down here, Preston said, gripping the legs of a piece of scaffolding. Hurry, get up the ladder, I yelled to one of the kids who was still with us. He climbed up onto the ladder, and then it was just Susan, Justin, and I remaining on the catwalk. All right, have it your way, Preston said, and began to shake the entire structure violently with his body weight heaving the supports back and forth and making the scaffolding wobble. The three of us were thrown side to side, and my heart nearly stopped as I was tossed into the railing and almost went over the edge, where I would have fallen to my death far below. But Susan grabbed my wrist and pulled me back, and we struggled towards the ladder. No, you can't leave, Preston shouted as he realized we were getting away, despite his deadly efforts. You can't. You're not allowed. He shook the scaffolding even harder, and I heard something snap just as I grabbed the bottom rung of the ladder. The entire structure collapsed beneath me in an instant, and I heard Preston's cries of outrage cut short as it crushed him beneath its weight. I was hanging by one hand from the ladder, and my fingers began to slip as my sweaty palms lost traction. Just as I was about to fall, Justin grabbed me by my shirt sleeve and pulled me up out of the hatch, and we collapsed in the snow on the roof. We laid there in the cold frost, breathless and exhausted, starving and terrified, and looked up to see the sun shining in the sky. The storm had ended, and the snow would melt. And soon, school would begin again. The story you just heard was written by me, and a variation of it previously featured on the Doctor No Sleep podcast and YouTube channel. If you'd like to check out their channel for more content, please check out the description below. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. If you'd like another way to help support the channel, 
please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, you'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening, please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow, and see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.